Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. In this video, we will be looking at the latest React 19 updates. We'll be going through the compiler, how you can integrate it into your project. And uh, we'll be looking at the new hooks and the APIs which are available in the release candidate and a few other features such as the support for meta tags and style sheets. All right, so let's get started with this video. So React now has a compiler, uh, which is experimental right now, and you can try it out in the latest release candidate. What the compiler does is that it automatically uh, optimizes your code following the rules of React and the rules of JavaScript. So it will go through your React code and the compiler understands the rules of React and JavaScript and it will, it will produce an optimized code. It will automatically memoize all the code so that you get performance benefits, right? And the optimized code is the thing which is now actually being sent to the browser. So they also provide a playground, which you can view on uh, playground.react.dev where you can write your regular React code and there are different phases which are available, uh, which you can view on this website. So you provide your code over here and it will give you the optimized JavaScript code, which is then actually sent to the browser, right? So the benefit of this is you no longer need to do manual memoization, right? So in the past, uh, wherever we had expensive calculation or large inputs, we would use functions or hooks such as use memo or use callback hook and react.memo, right? Those are things that you are, you might be familiar with. With this new compiler, you no longer need to do manual memoization. It does that for you and it performs granular memoization compared to, you know, manual memoization. So it also considers use cases which you might miss out, right? So there are a lot of benefits of using the compiler. Although it is still experimental, you can give it a try. Um, and uh, it also tries to solve the problem with manual memoization, which is most of the times it is not done correctly. We might, you know, miss out some use cases and which does not lead to any significant performance gains. So that is one of the things which the React team has been working on for a while. And uh, let's see how we can enable the React compiler. So what we will do is we will go to react.dev and then we will head over to the section for React compiler. So they have provided a couple of tools which allow you to check whether the code base is compatible with the React compiler. And then uh, once you run this script, it will give you this output. The next thing that you can do is uh, you can also install the ESLint plugin React compiler, which is recommended by the React team, which allows you to follow the rules of React and stick to them uh, so that the best practices are followed in your code base because the compiler will skip anything which, which it finds violates the rules of React. So it will skip that code and it will not optimize it, right? So that is why they have recommended this plugin. And now let's take a look at how we can add this uh, to our project. So it is available as a Babel plugin. So I'm using Vite over here. Let's take a look at the instructions for Vite. So I have this Babel plugin already installed. I'll just follow the steps given over here. I'll go head over to my Vite config, paste this, right? And uh, inside the React plugin, which we already have, I'll just add this piece of code over here, right? And let's run this release candidate app. So if you take a look at the package.json, I'm using the React 19 release candidate. Okay, so React and React DOM packages are from the release candidate. So it will work out of the box with the React compiler. Um, so we will run the pnpm dev command to start the server. It's working on localhost 5173. So let me just copy this over here and paste it. So you can see that this application is working. Let me open the developer tools. Let's head over to the components. And uh, if the React compiler is working in your application, you will see this, uh, you know, memo along with the star um, annotation in the component uh, or the React developer tools Chrome extension or, right? And this tells you that, you know, this piece of code has been automatically memoized, right? So this is a way to figure out whether this code which that you're seeing is actually um, the optimized code which is generated through the React experimental compiler, all right? So this is how you can easily integrate the compiler into your code base. They have given a few other ways. You can either have it available as an annotation. So wherever you use the use memo directive, it will only try to optimize those code bits. Or you can specify um, in the compiler config, you can specify a particular path or particular folder where you would like to see the compiler working, right? So they have given out different options, which you can either follow in your existing projects or, um, or you can try it in your new projects. There is a great article by Jack Harrington to use it in react 18 projects, the react compiler. I'll link it in the description along with the other links. So now let's take a look at the new features, which are available in the react 19. So as you can see, I already have this project set up and I have some examples over here. So the first thing is that we have a new use API. It's an API. It's not a hook because uh, you can use it conditionally and uh, because it is like a hook, but it does not follow all of the rules of a hook. 
that is uh, it can be used inside conditionals and loops so we'll be taking a look at that right now um, and another thing that you can do is uh, with the new use hook it allows you to resolve uh, a promise value as well as a context value so it is a direct replacement for the use context hook. You no longer need to use the use context hook in React 19. You can make use of this use API instead. And another thing that it allows us to do is it allows us to stream a promise from the server component to the client using the use API. So first, let's take a look at how we can do that. So I have uh, another code base set up over here using the Next.js 15 release candidate. So you can uh, set up the Next.js 15 release candidate by following this command. You can make use of this. So this is what I use to create this empty setup. So let me just start this up. So we'll say pnpm dev, which will start the next server. And let's open this over here, localhost 3000. All right, so it gives us a basic hello world, right? Uh, what we want to do is we want to see how we can stream a promise from the server component to the client. So what we will do is we have two files over here. We have a page which we are going to use for uh, displaying a list of messages. We will be getting the list of messages and we'll be streaming the promise and render it to the client, right? So for that, what we will do is first we will create a uh, function. Let's call it messages, which is basically a server component. And then uh, what we will do is you will get the promise and we'll create a function which gives us the list of messages. So we'll say const get messages. And this is going to return a new promise and we're not going to use an actual API. We'll just, you know, mimic the behavior of an API, right? So what we will do is we will use a set timeout function here and let's give it a timeout of 1500 milliseconds and it will just resolve an array. It will have a bunch of messages. I, uh, this is next JS 15 release candidate. Uh, and we're testing the use API for promise resolution. All right. Okay. So what we will do is we will call over here, get messages. We will not use the async function over here since we are interested in the promise, right? So this will give us the promise. And then, uh, what we will do is basically we will return an article over here. And inside that we will have a client component, which we will build over here. So we will have export default function message list, which is going to accept the message promise, right? And what we will do is uh, we will get the message list. We will make use of the new use API. So the use API is available in react. So we'll say import use from react and this API will get the promise that we are passing as a prop. And what we will do is we will go over the message list. We will get the uh, message and what we will do is we will just return a paragraph. The key is the message itself and uh, the content is the message as well, right? So pretty simple and we need to use the use client directive over here to inform the, uh, to inform that this is a client component and there's a distinction between the uh, server component and the client component we need to specify function over here. And here we'll make use of the message list, right? And we will give it the message promise and let's head over to the messages and you can see it's trying to, you know, uh, load the messages and show the server component over here to make the user experience better. What we can do is basically wrap this inside a suspense boundary, right? Let's move all of this inside the suspense boundary and let's show a fallback over here. So what we will do is we'll just show a paragraph over here and say loading messages till the promise is being resolved. So it will show this text of loading message. And once the promise has been resolved, right, uh, it will show the actual message list. So you can see it was pretty easy and straightforward to, uh, you know, make use of the use hook over here. You just pass the promise to your client component. And once it resolved it, we were able to see the list of messages. So you can see all of the messages which we, which were there. So another benefit of this is that you can start something on the server and while that thing is in progress, the entire HTML is streamed to the client. And once the data has been resolved, the suspense fallback component is hidden and the actual content is then shown. So it's a very good user experience and you can easily achieve it using the use hook. Now you might be wondering, can I use the use hook on the client side as well? So the answer is that yes, you can but it is not supported directly, but let's take a look at how we can make use of the use hook at the client side. So let's head over to the client code base that we have over here. 
that is vanilla react right which is set up using wheat so i'll just walk you over the application structure so over here we have the main.jsx file so we're making use of react router dom and we have all the routes set up over here and then we have our main application route which basically consists of a layout and within the layout we have the header the side navigation and then we have the main content which is being rendered by the router right so depending on the uh you know route that you're on it will show that inside this main section let's take a look at how you would you know use uh, to fetch data using an api prior to the use hook at the client side so what we would do is uh, if you take a look at this page we have this uh, use api over here so basically what we're doing over here is that we have this component user with effect which basically returns this and what we're trying to do over here is we have this use effect and we're calling this load api function which is nothing but a fetch call which fetches the api that you give over here gets the json and returns the json response um, and then once this is available we are setting this response to the user info state and then we are just showing the first name of uh, whatever is returned from the results right so you can see that uh, elfie is being returned so i'm making use of the random user api to get a random person's name so let's take a look at how we can implement the same thing using the use api at the client side so for that uh, what we will do is um, let me just click on this link over here you can see that it is this route is linked with this user component and it is showing this message this is the user component let's create a new component over here function user info so this basically is going to get the user and we are going to make use of the use hook uh, which is available from react so you can see that i have it imported over here and then we are going to call the load api over here and we'll pass it the same url right and then what we want to do is uh once we have this we want to return the user's first name right so what we will do is we will say user dot results of index zero and basically i'll just copy this part and paste it here and uh, over here what we will do is we will make use of suspense we'll have a fallback and we will just say loading user info and then within this we will load the user info component right let's save this so it's showing you loading user info and then once the info has been loaded it basically shows that name right now this is working but if you take a look at the developer tools and head over to the console you will get this error over here uh, the component was suspended by an uncached promise it says that uh, you need some sort of a promise cache in order for this to work correctly because what this does is that until the time the uh, you know the promise has been resolved it will show the fallback component that is why we see that loading user info text over here and the moment uh, this promise is resolved it will trigger a re-render of this component so basically you know it will come over here again and try to re-render that component it will you know go into an infinite loop and that is why you're getting this warning right so in order to fix this what we will do is we are we are going to implement our own promise cache so for that let's do one thing let's create a new function over here load it will get the api url and what we will do is we'll create a uh, promise cache so promise cache which is going to be a new map and what we will check is um we'll try to get the promise from the promise cache first we'll check whether there exists a promise with this matching url uh if it does we will basically return that promise in case the promise doesn't exist right what we will do is we will uh, we will get the promise we'll call the load api right and give it the uh, api url over here once we have that we will set it in the promise cache so we will say promise cache dot set we will store the api as the key and the promise as the value for it right and over here instead of using this we will use the load function which we just wrote and pass it the uh, url that we had which is this and now what we will do is let's do a refresh and you can see that we no longer get that error message and when we come back to this it's trying to fetch that user information uh, and until it is being fetched until the promise is being resolved it will show the fallback and then once it is available it will try to you know show the user's uh, information and we no longer get that error so the benefit over here is that you know we have gotten rid of this state we no longer need the use effect we are just calling the api getting the promise once the promise has been resolved we are directly showing it so you no longer need uh, a state over here right 
and you no longer need a effect use kind of you know takes care of all that it's a very useful api and in the future react team will provide some mechanism wherein you won't have to use some sort of a suspend a suspense enabled caching library or build your own caching logic right so uh, that's a great api which you can use the next thing that we are going to look at is how you can read the context values using the use api so what we are going to do is we will head over to our app we will create a theme context so we have const theme context equals uh, create context which is available from react so we are creating a theme context and let's export this and then what we'll do is we'll head over to our main app and in react 19 you also don't need to say context or provider you can directly make use of the context so let's see what i'm talking about so what we will do is we will basically put uh, the layout inside our theme context we'll give it a value right and wrap the layout inside this theme context then the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to create a state and we will create a function which will which we will use to toggle our theme all right so we'll call it theme then set theme by default we'll use the light theme right and then let's create a toggle function which will basically uh, toggle between the two themes so whatever is the previous theme right if the previous theme is light then we are going to return dark otherwise we will return light okay and uh, and for the value we will say that this is basically accepting the theme and the toggle function all right let's save this and what we will do is in order to toggle our we'll add the toggle uh, functionality to our header so over here let's do one thing um let's add a button over here uh, within the button we'll check uh, if the theme is light right so in order to get the theme we need to first read the uh, theme and uh, to do that we'll make use of the new use api and we'll read the theme context right so you no longer need to make use of the use context hook you can just make use of the use api so as you remember the value that we gave to the theme context it was the theme variable as well as the toggle function right so we are just destructuring uh, the theme value over here right and we're just checking if the theme is light in that case we will basically show the uh, moon icon uh, let's give it a class name let's give it a height of five and a width of five so this project is using tailwind all right and um, otherwise we will show the sun icon uh, same classes okay and we close this so you can see we have this moon icon right now and in order to toggle this what we will do is basically um, write an on click over here and let's also get the toggle function right from the context and we'll just basically call this toggle function when we click on it now in order for the dark theme to work dark and light theme to work what we will do is we will also read the theme in our layout so once again we make use of the use api read the theme context and uh, in tailwind you can basically uh, make use of this data mode property so we are going to say data mode is equal to theme right and i have configured this in the tailwind config right for the dark mode we are using a selector and we are using this value like data mode equal to dark like this so you need to specify how you can identify the dark mode so we that is why we added this data mode attribute and we're setting it the theme value let's save this and now when I click on this button, you can see wherever uh, I had made use of the dark classes, those classes are now being available, right? So in the dark mode, when the theme is dark, right? You can see that it changed the background to slate and the text to white. So that is what you see over here. And uh, this is the toggle logic or the button logic which we had written. So right now the theme is dark, right? So that is why it is showing the sun icon. When I click on the sun icon, it is showing us the moon icon. So you can see this is how we can uh, make use of the use API to read the context as well. Um, I also have a route set up for the same thing. So basically what you can do over here is you can have the same logic in the header as well as anywhere else. So if we go over here, we look at this, if we go to our routes, we have this theme toggler, right? So this is the context which is associated with this route, correct? So let's go inside this component and we can have the same logic over here. So const theme, and uh, the toggle function which we're getting so we make use of the use hook we read the theme context right and we can have this button over here we can say toggle theme right and uh, also read the value of the theme so let's add a paragraph over here the current theme is theme and whenever we click on this we will call the toggle function which we are getting from the context and it says the current theme is light 
let's get rid of this semicolon. And then when we click on this button, you can see that from here also we can toggle the theme and the icon is changing. So yeah, it's really useful. As I told you earlier, you can also use the use API within conditions. So let's see how we can do that. So what we will do is we have this conditional para. So we will check if it's true, right? If the value of show is true, in that case, we basically get the theme from the theme context and we just return a paragraph. This para is now visible in whatever is the value of the theme. Okay. All right. And let's head over to the route for this component. And you can see right now show is set to true. If I set it to false and this is the route for the conditional para, right? I have not saved the changes yet. And what we will do is if it is true, right? We are returning this. It is going to read the theme. If we are not showing this component, then there's no need to read the theme, right? So we will just uh, return, uh, we'll just return null over here, okay, right? And let's save this. Let's head over to the conditional context. And you can see that, you know, nothing is being shown for this route. And when we uh, set show to true, you can see that it is, it is saying this pad is now visible in light theme. Let me just fix the spacing for this, right? And if I toggle the theme, it is showing this pad is now visible in dark theme. So this is how you can now use this uh, API conditionally. So you only fetch the value from the context if you want to show something, otherwise you don't fetch it. So this expensive computation, which would we would have needed if we were not making use of this new API, if we were to use the hook version of this, right? If you were making use of the use context hook, in that case, we would have had to write this line irrespective of whether this component was being shown or not. So another cool thing about React 19 is that they now support asynchronous transitions. So basically any asynchronous function are now known as actions in React 19. So let's take a look at what those actions are, right? So let me click on this action route. So we have these use cases, right? Where we are trying to submit some data when we are submitting it, right? So we try to disable this button so that the user does not click on it multiple times until the transition is going on. So let's take a look at the code for this. So we have this component over here, which is update name, right? And then what we're trying to do is basically whenever we are clicking on handle submit, we will set this pending state to true so that the button that we have over here, the submit button, it is disabled whenever it is pending. So you can see that when I click on this, it becomes disabled, right? And uh, once the name has been updated, we are calling this API over here, which is responsible for, you know, updating the name somewhere, probably in the database. And then one, the update is complete. We're setting this back to false and uh, okay, let's try to update this over here, you know, till the time it is updating it in the background, it is, you know, showing this button is disabled, then it is logging the updated value in the console and we're setting the pending thing to false, right? So this is a very common use case. So React in this release is trying to handle all of uh, these common use cases and provide useful hooks for that. So what they have done is they already had the use transition hook available. Now they have allowed the support for asynchronous functions inside of that. Earlier that was not possible. So what we can do is we can do something like this. We have the same example, but this time we'll make use of the use transition API. The use transition API basically gives us two things. The is pending value and a uh, start transition function using which you can start a transition, right? So this hook is useful whenever we are trying to do any sort of data mutations. And we do a lot of things manually, such as disabling buttons, showing some transient data or handling the pending states, right? So this hook allows us to do all of that uh, conveniently. And now let's uh, try and understand how we can achieve the same functionality with the help of the use transition hook. Because a lot of times when we do uh, data mutations, we have to handle a lot of things manually, right? You saw over here, we, ha we wrote our own pending state. Uh, we were you know, setting it to true. Then the update was happening. Once the update was complete, we were setting it to false. So in React 19, they have given us uh, asynchronous transitions, which they're calling as actions, right? Any asynchronous transition is known as an action. So this was already available in React 18. Uh, but now the difference is that to the start transition function, you can pass an asynchronous function. And here, what we're basically doing is when you click on submit, right, we are using the use transition hook. And here we're passing an asynchronous function, which is basically calling the uh, update name API. Till the time this transition is happening, it will automatically set the is pending state to true and is pending uh, state is set to this disabled prop. So it will automatically disable the button. And uh, once the operation has been successfully completed, React will automatically set the pending flag to false. So let's take a look at this. So I'll enter my name over here and click on submit. You can see till it is trying to submit the data, the button was disabled. And once the API gave a response, it basically set the pending state to false. So this is a very common use case. So React has now given us a hook with this ability. Now taking this example further, it is very common to use forms and uh, 
for that uh, react has given us another new hook so you can see over here i have a form over here which has a label then we have this section which uh, has an input field and then there's a button to basically accept this value and it will show this updated value in the label over here so let's write the logic for this uh, so before this hook the new hook that I'm talking about, which is use action state, we would do something like this, right? So this form would have the on submit event, which we would, you know, then bind to this handle submit. We would have to do event dot prevent default to, you know, prevent the page from deloading. Then we would get the form value. Uh, we will do something like uh, get the form from the event, uh, use the form data class, and then uh, get the values using form data dot get. And then we would, you know, call the update API. And then to reset the form, we would have to, you know, use some sort of a state and set that state back to empty to clear the values, right? So all of this is handled automatically by this new hook. Let's take a look at how we can do that. So in forms, now you can pass functions and let's take a look at the use action state hook. What this hook does is basically returns three values. It gives us a state. It gives us a submit action, which is used to update the state. And it gives us the is pending flag, right? So we will say use action state over here and this hook basically uh, accepts an asynchronous function and this function uh, gets two things which is the previous state that is the state which was available before the submit action happened and the form data right and what we will do over here is that we will get the name using this form data that we are getting and we can just directly do form data dot get and you can see we want to read this input right so the name for this is name so we will get the value of this input field using this api and then we will try to update the names so we'll say updated name and we will say await update name api and we will pass it the name that we got and we will return this updated name and this um so this hook basically ex accepts an updater function which is used to update the state and an initial value for the state so the initial value for the state is uh Gaurav, for example and then what we will do over here is that besides the label we will just show the state so you can see that the initial state is Gaurav. that is what we have specified over here so this basically uh gets the updater function as well as the initial state value so this gets assigned to this right and this is what we are using over here and what we want to do is in react 19 you can now pass functions to the action prop instead of just a url so this is a submit action function which is nothing but this function it is a reference to this function so we will basically call this so whenever the submit button is clicked it will look at the action prop and we'll see oh this is the submit action and submit action basically points to this function and it will call this function with the previous state and with the form data right so you get the uh, form api over here and you can easily access the controls which are within the available within this form and now let's try to update this name so for example updated name over here let's try and submit this and you can also see that it gave us the is pending flag let me bind this to the disabled property of this button let's save this and now let me try and submit so while that api is being called this button was disabled the moment the update happened it updated this name it automatically reset this input field and uh, you can see that it is very convenient to use this hook right now because a lot of things that we are doing ourselves as you can see in this code over here we're able to do it very easily with the help of this hook. Another great benefit of this is that in case if there was an error over here, you have the previous state, right? So you can just return the previous state over here. So it will basically show the previous state then. So this is how you can make use of the action state hook. Another new hook which has been provided by the React team is the use form status hook. So with this hook, any of the child components which are nested inside a form, they get access to the forms state that state can be used by that child component so it's kind of a use context but for that form specifically so let's see how we can do that so i have another example for this use form status so we have the same hook over here we have this form and we have this submit button right so let's try to do the update name over here with the default code the functionality is the same as before it will disable that button update the updated name once the api is successful and the state is updated over here right you can see that sorry over here okay so what we want to do over here is that instead of using this button over here we'll create a new component which will read the parent forms state using the use form status hook so we will create a submit button and we will use the form status hook use form status this basically uh, returns two things a pending state and the data so this data is nothing but the data object that you get over here and you can read the form values over here so what we will do is uh, let me just copy this button over here and paste it what we will check over here is that we will basically disable this button when it is pending and let's show a different text over here while it is pending we will basically say saving and uh, we will say data.get we will get the name property from the form and we will display you know what the property that it is trying to save and uh, otherwise what we will do is we will just show the save uh, text over here and now we will add over here the submit button 
or the submit component that we just created. So let's do a refresh and you can see that it is showing the name Gaurav over here. Let's change it to updated name or let's just use a name, for example, Jason. Um, let's try to save this. So you can see it's trying to save this, right? It showed that text in the button. So basically uh, till the action was pending, it was showing, you know, saving the updated name. And once the uh, action completed, it replaced the updated name over here and automatically reloaded the form or cleared the input values, right? So another useful hook. So you can use this hook inside any of the child components present inside a form and you can create components, reusable components, which allow you to do these kind of things, right? So it's another very handy hook. The next hook that we will be looking at is the use optimistic hook. Let's head over to the example with that. So what we have over here is basically uh, a form which has this section. We are making use of the action state hook over here as well. So it's giving us a state submit action in the pending state as well. And what we ha have over here is the previous state and the form data. So um, this is the initial state. And over here, we also have a error property, which is initially set to null and the name is initially blank, as you can see over here, right? So uh, we also have this use ref hook over here. The initial value is zero. And I'll tell you why we're using this. So basically what we have done over here is uh, we are making use of this API. You give it the updated name and this ref counter, and then uh, you update the ref counter. And basically what this API does is that it checks if the ID is one of this, it will resolve it. Otherwise it will reject it with an error. So I've specifically built this example so that you can see how you can make use of this use optimistic hook, right? So the way this hook works is that it will reflect the optimistic value immediately uh, once it is set and you can show some transient state while the update is happening over here, right? Once the update is successfully completed or in case there's an error, the optimistic state is then, you know, replaced with that updated state, whether it is the error one or the successful one, right? So it does that. And let's take a look at uh, the implementation over here. So in case there's an error, right, in the state, so we show this error message and uh, we also set the border to red for the input, right, in case of an error. And when we try to update it the second time, it will show an error, right? So let's do that over here. So I'll update the name to Gaurav. Initially it is blank. So let's save this. So you can see that it is trying to save it. Once the update happened, it saved it. Now let's try to update the name to Jason. And this time, uh, since the, you know, the counter value was not one, it showed this error, right? But we want to improve this user experience. And in order to do that, we will make use of the use optimistic hook. What we will do is uh, basically use that hook. So we will have this optimistic name and set optimistic name, which we will use to update this optimistic name. And we will use the use optimistic hook, uh, which accepts uh, initial value. So it will point to the same state that we have defined over here, right? And what we will do is over here, instead of, uh, you know, displaying the default state name, what we will do is we will show the optimistic name over here. And, uh, and the other thing that we want to do is we want to show some transient state in between, right? When the optimistic update is happening. So optimistic, we have this, uh, actually let's just call it as optimistic. Rather, let's rename this to optimistic and we will say optimistic since it points to this state, right? Which has these two props. So we'll say when optimistic dot name is not equal to state dot name, right? In that case, we want to show some text. So you just want to say, uh, over here, saving, we want to give some indication to the user that is trying to, you know, save this name. And let's just make use of some tailwind classes, text, green, 400. And otherwise, uh, we do not show anything. Let's save this. Uh, oh, right. I need to fix this over here. It needs to be optimistic name, right? Let's do a refresh. And uh, what we want to do over here is that when we are trying to get the name, we will immediately, you know, update it so that the user gets the impression that the value is being updated and we'll show some feedback to the user. It will show this, you know, transient state until the time this, you know, action is pending. Once this action is complete, we will update this state and then this updated state will be assigned to this optimistic value. Okay. So the way this works is React will, you know, immediately show this update on the UI till the action is pending. And once the action is complete, it will go back to the value and will show the updated value uh, and the updated value can be the error value or the successful value, right? So let's see. So what we will do over here is that we will just say set optimistic name and we will give the optimistic name over here and uh, let's save this and let's try to update the name to Gaurav. Let's save this. You can see it's trying to save this, right? When the uh, action was, you know, till this action was pending, it was showing this state, right? Because the optimistic name was not equal to the current state, right? And once the uh, this promise resolved, right? It basically, uh, both of these states were same. 
So it stopped showing this text and it directly showed the value over here. Now let's try to update this name further to JSON. And this time it's trying to save. Now an error happened. And what we are going to do over here is in case of an error, you noticed over here it was showing JSON. And then um, once the error happened, we switched back to the previous state that we got from the action state hook, right? So we reverted back to the previous state and we are showing the error that we are getting. So let's say we want to update this to Jim and let's save this. So it's trying to save Jim and the previous value was gone, right? So it switched back to the previous value because there was an error. So let's also debug this to get a sense of better understanding. So what we will do is basically let's add a breakpoint over here where we are trying to, you know, call our API. So let's try to update to JSON and you can see that right now uh, we have not called the API. Now it's trying to call the API. So it's showing you this saving text in the meantime. Now there was an error uh, and now it will try to update the current state with the, you know, updated state. Let's go ahead. Now once the state was updated, it reverted back to the previous state and it stopped showing that saving message, right? So stop showing this text. This example, it is pretty clear that till the time the promise was not resolved. It was in the pending state. It was showing the optimistic value. And then once the action was successfully or erroneously completed, it updated the optimistic state to the updated state, right? The current state right now, which we are setting over here, whether it's this one in case of success like this, for example, let's save JSON over here. I've refreshed the page now. It's trying to save it. Now the promise has resolved and now it will update the state. And that is when the actual update happens. So I hope with this example, all of these hooks are clear to you. I'll link the GitHub repository for this as well as the Next.js example in the description. Some of the other features which are available in React 19 are as follows. Let's head over to the React 19 updates page. So React dot dev and uh, let's go to their blog and let's take a look at the release candidate. Actually, let me just head over to this update, right? So, so some of the updates that they have done is that you no longer need to use the forward ref function. You can directly access it as a prop now. And then uh, there are some updates with respect to the hydration errors. And then uh, I showed this one to you earlier that you no longer need to use uh, context.provider. You can uh, just make use of this context property directly. And uh, apart from this, you can now pass a initial value to the deferred hook. And the other interesting aspect is that uh, there is now support for metadata tags uh, built in React. This is very useful in case of SEO and you no longer have to be dependent on external libraries like React Helmet for majority of the use cases. So what this is basically doing is that now you can use these meta tags right within your component and React will you know automatically hoist them to the correct position in the document so that these uh, updates are reflected within your page, right? So this is something that you can try out on your own. Then there is also support for for style sheets, you can link those style sheets. You can also specify a precedence for them, which tells where this style sheet needs to play along with all the other style sheets, whether it needs to come before that. You can specify a precedence over here. This is another great update. And then they have support for async scripts. Uh, you can also preload some of the resources you in your components using these functions. So a lot of this functionality is basically for framework authors. It is not something that you would generally use. So that is why I'm not covering these in detail with an example, but uh, just wanted to give you an overview of what is available, right? And finally, they are supporting custom elements. Uh, so you can go through this blog yourself to see what are the other updates. In case you have any questions, you can let me know in the comments. If you like this video, do subscribe to the channel and give this video a like uh, and share it with your friends. So I'll see you in the next video. Until then, take care and bye bye.